uh, thank you. My name is uh, Luke Katz. I was a businessman based in New York, and among other things, the president of EMCA, the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance. About a year ago, as we were approaching the bicentennial, EMCA formed the American Hellenic Revolution of 1821 Bicentennial Committee. Over the last year, we have had a series of events, lectures, and panel discussions focusing not only on the revolution in Greece, but also importantly on the American diaspora and international aspects and influences of the revolution for its 200th anniversary, and which are all available on YouTube. I would like to thank the Plato Academy administration, staff, and you, the students, for the opportunity of making this brief Greek Revolution Bi Bicentennial Committee presentation today. In America, from its founding, there was an emergence of Hellenism, classical education, not only of men, but also of women. The popular use of classics in the past, in the post-Hellenic, in the post-American revolutionary period, cut across class lines in towns and cities, when, with many of them adopting Hellenic names. It shows distinctly in the new American national capital, Washington, in its architecture, concepts of law and democracy, and, its, and it's in, in its capital building, with its famous frescoes by historical painter Konstantinos Brumidis in his apotheosis of Washington, adorning the underside of the dome in its rotunda. American Philhellenism in 1821, when the Hellenic Revolution broke out 200 years ago from the Ottoman Empire, after about 400 years of occupation and slavery, caught America by storm. Historically, in American history, it is referred to as the Greek fever. It was influenced and inspired in part by America's contact with the Ottoman Empire and the Barbary states, but also from American missionary and commercial interests that led to its first military conflicts abroad relating to those Barbary Wars and America's first wars. Americans also knew the Hellenes as slaves in the East and also as fellow warriors in America's first battle and victory on foreign soil in the Battle of Derna in 1805. U.S. Marines and Greek mercenaries who supported them inspired the U.S. Marines hymn line to the shores of Tripoli relating to that battle. When the Hellenic Revolution broke out and through the efforts of many, Greek committees throughout the United States were formed rapidly to support the relief effort financially, and in some cases, Americans went to fight in Greece. They included, for example, uh, George Jarvis, a New Yorker, Captain Jonathan Miller of Vermont, Dr. Samuel uh, Gridley Howe of Massachusetts, who also became the chief surgeon of the Hellenic Navy, George Wilson of, of Providence, Rhode Island, James Williams, an African-American slave from Baltimore who joined the, the Greek Navy, and many others. The Greek Revolution was inspired in many ways by the American Revolution of 1776 before it. And also, it affected America as a con consequence in many different ways. Many who fought in Greece and others, men and women who were members of the Greek committees in the United States, as well as Greeks, including war orphans um, in the revolution who came to the US, became and were serious abolitionists in America and significant opponents of American slavery. The Greek revolution not only affected the early and subsequent American abolitionist movement, but through it, also the American women's suffrage movement, which followed it. It is my honor uh, today to introduce uh, Eric Hill, who will make the main presentation. He is a technologist in the third decade of his exceptional professional career and holds a bachelor's degree of science in computer engineering from the University of New Hampshire. Regardless of his, of his successful career, 
he has found time to perform significant and acknowledged volunteer efforts that are youth-centered over those years and with a laser focus on STEM pipeline development, mentorship, and empowerment. Since 2014, he has served as a volunteer director of the Diaspora Hellenic Combatives Program that has served the youth of, of various Hellenic communities from Florida across the U.S. and Canada. He has served as an advisor for the Sons of Hercules in Florida and is a member of the American Hellenic Revolution of 1821 Bicentennial Committee. Eric has a long interest, a long-term interest, in the Hellenic Charter School concept as a vehicle for youth development in America. His lecture today is entitled, The Greek Revolution of 1821, is your history because it is American history. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for the introduction and the summary. First slide. So to reiterate, this presentation is entitled, next slide. The Greek Revolution of 1821 is your history because it's American history. And as Lucatos iterated, what I'm going to go over is how American citizens across the states and the territories actually participated in the revolution. It's an untold history, but as part of US Greece 2021, and you'll see this uh, video we're going to play too, the US government sponsorships, and we're not sponsored by US Greece 21, 21 is. Next slide. This portrait, Lou mentioned Samuel Gridley Howe, this portrait was made by his son-in-law decades after his participation in the Greek Revolution. So I thought it would be fitting, actually for more than this reason, to come in in traditional clothing. So you can actually see the embroidery, and it's detailed in this painting, but it's much finer in person. Do you agree? Right. Now, in addition, not only that, the three warriors Lou mentioned, George Jarvis, who became Brigadier General of the Greek Army, Samuel Gridley Howe, Surgeon Chief of the Hellenic Fleet, and Jonathan Peckham Miller, who became a colonel in the Greek army, they were all wearing the clothing and learned the Greek language. Now next to me, and she's gonna play a part later also, is my daughter. Now, have you guys learned Greek? Yes. yes. You have, okay. What's her name? Anaya. Anaya, beautiful name. What's her name? So what's my daughter's name? Bravo. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So next slide. Okay. The first Barbary War. As Mr. Katsos iterated, I want to give you a time, time uh, segment to reference. 1801 to 1805. That was the first Barbary War against the USS Constitution. Now he mentioned Tripoli in the Marine Fight Zone. Important to this is Stephen Decatur. He was seen in the United States of America as the warrior of warriors. The USS Constitution, he came in command to briefly. Both come into play later in our story, which will bear with us only a few minutes. Second Barbary War was against the Ottoman Empire also, in the Barbary States. Stephen Decatur came, they won in a few months, he was a commander of a 10-ship squadron. They sent him there to take care of business with the Ottoman Empire. So you can imagine with two wars, the United States was in a fervor against the Ottoman Empire. Next slide. But another event occurred that rose the citizens of Europe and the US in particular, the event of Solongo in 1803. Pay attention to that date, that's, be, that's during the first Barbary War. So imagine you're at war with the Ottoman Empire and this event happens with civilians on a mountainside in Juanina Iporos. To avoid enslavement and torture by approaching Ottoman Empire soldiers, women and children danced to their deaths. Today, a memorial <clears throat> stands at the cliffs of Zalongo. Now, the US Army, with the State Department, released a video of the dance of Zalongo. It's a rendition of a traditional song composed much later than the actual event. Next slide. So I'd like to hear you listen to this as we start, really, the presentation. And they did a wonderful job, by the way. Again, the U.S. Army. Thank you. 
Now again, that song recollected a tragic, tragic event. As again, Mr. Katsos recalled, Greek fever ensued the citizens of the United States of America, also going through, also going through the Neo-Hellenic movement, which was everyone was, as he mentioned, in education, studying the classic language. This path shows the three warriors we mentioned, three out of the four warriors we mentioned so far. In 1821, George Jarvis, the son of an ambassador, studying at a university but well-disciplined, well made his way by land to Marseille in France. So he made his way in 1821. So he took, took part in his journey much sooner than Samuel Gridley Howe of, in Boston and Jonathan Peckham Miller of Virginia. They both departed from Boston Jonathan Peckham Miller was from Vermont. He actually had sponsorship of the Greek community of Boston. Samuel Gridley Howe had a letter from the executive of the Greek committee of Boston to, to hand to the Greek uh, government and service. But he had sponsorship from a friend that actually loaned him money. And he had just graduated from Harvard. So Boston comes into play later on, and you'll know why, because I'm going to point it out. Again, think 1821. Jarvis, 1824. Target, Greece. Next slide. This today is the region we think of as Greece. You can see the borders outlined. The Dodecanisa, Rhodos, Amitalini, etc. On the south, you see Crete. To the west, the Ionian Islands. However, this wasn't even close to what would become Greece in 1830 and then later 1832. Next slide. This is the field of battle, the campaign. So George Jarvis, again, Brigadier General of the Hellenic Army, Jonathan Peckham Middle, Colonel 
to the Hellenic army, and Surgeon Chief of the Hellenic Fleet, also known for close combat and command, Samuel Goodley Howe, they played all in this area. At this time, I'm going to do some readings a little bit later. I'm going to speak of Candia. Candia is actually Crete. In 19th century English, they referred to it as Candia. We won't get into it at this point in time. But the field of battle was all here. Now, obviously I brought a sword. I'm dressed as a, as a warrior. But I'm not going to talk to you about the battle campaign. As we relayed, what we're going to actually talk about is how citizens across the United States of America partook uh, in, the, in that revolution. Next slide. After the fall of Mesolongi, Miller meanders into Smyrna in Asia Minor. And again, I'll show you where that city is. Miller leaves for the USA, arriving in November 1826. So he arrives back in 1826 at the end of the year. In May 1827, so what he did is he made contact with the New York Greek Committee. If you remember, when he left, he was sponsored by the Boston Greek Committee. He now is sponsored by the New York Greek Committee. He sends ships. And I'm gonna, you'll hear this later on. I'm going to bring it up again. The Philadelphia Greek Committee sent more supplies later on. So, so the, the sources of funding and material were coming from the, the states and the territories, but they were funneling, as you can see, out through these coastal cities. So again, New York, he was sponsored by the New York Committee. And you're going to hear this in the writings, but also Philadelphia was sending supplies. The USS Constitution and the Mediterranean Squadron, a lot of people don't know the story, especially you guys. Does anyone know what the USS Constitution is? Yeah. Uh, isn't it the uh, Constitution of... I no, that's, that's, good. that's fine. The USS Constitution today is still in service. So the USS Constitution protected supplies from the citizens of the United States of America and the Greek Revolution. It is still in service in Boston as a Department of Defense asset. It's a museum ship. We're going to show you some videos shortly so you get an idea of what was happening in Greek waters. And we're going to talk to about the captain too. The USS Constitution, again, protected those supplies from pirates. Remember we talked about the Barbary Wars? In 18, 1815 was the second one that ended. It was all about pirates. So now flash forward. We're now at 1827. There are still various pirates roaming, and even you had to protect it from the Ottoman Empire. Miller enlists Howe and Jarvis to disperse supplies. And you'll hear in what I'm about to read, and we've uncovered, this was actually recommended by the New York Greek Committee itself. So these men, what they were doing had reached all throughout the American lands. But again, the important part here, Men, women, children were giving funding and supplies to the cause. And you're going to hear this when I read out some of these things. Next slide. <clears throat> those of you that have not visited the USS Constitution, and those that have maybe had visited static, I wanted to show this video. Again, the USS Constitution, it's a remarkable story, is still with us. Can you hit play? It's still with us as a ship. So you can see it in the waters. These are modern ships. It's still dwarfing them. This is made of wood. Okay? So remember, this still exists. It's in Boston Harbor. If you get to Boston, I urge you to visit it as American citizens and understanding the broad history of the USS Constitution. In the context of the bicentennial we're celebrating, it was there. <laughs> it's amazing. So see the panning view. It is big. Picture it with cannon. Okay? It's intimidating. Next slide. Now we're back to the field of operations. Now, I mentioned, I touched on the field of the battle campaigns. However, we're looking at this map a little bit differently now. This is the field of delivering humanitarian aid to the Greek civilians. Women, children, elderly, maybe they're providers that were destitute also. Okay? When you think of Greece today, you think of the country I showed you. However, this was really the field of operations. There was suppression in all these other areas. So they really, they could, nothing really launched there. Samuel Goodley Howe, again, 
you know, some supplies, and you'll read this, you hear this later, did reach Crete from this expedition. However, what's the capital of Greece today? Does anyone know? Yes, sir. Athens. You got it. But, but, in 1827, the capital of Greece was Naplion, or Napoli. You'll hear the, you see it written in English uh, in these 19th century texts. Now, we're going to keep this up. What I'm going to do is read some entries. And what you're going to understand, this document, these documents I'm reading from, on an iPhone, by the way. <laughs> so these documents are from 19th century. They're on Google Books. In fact, there's a lot of them. A lot of people didn't even know they existed, but because of what I do, I understood there was a good potential, and I found some of them. We did. This is the Conditions of Greece, written in 1828 by Colonel Miller. This document, you're going to hear how they put the slides, and I promise you I'm not going to read it like a professor. And feel free, if you do have some brief questions, feel free to ask, okay? Just raise your hand and we'll, we'll, be, we'll meander through it. Now, this letter, remember I mentioned the New York Committee, way west, when they dispersed Miller, this is the letter they gave him. On arrival at your port of discharge, you will immediately, if practicable, consult with your countrymen, Dr. Howe and Mr. Jarvis and such other individuals of known intelligence and fidelity to the cause of liberty in Greece. Remember that, you talk about American liberty. Do you hear how he's speaking? The cause of liberty in Greece, as may be within your reach, upon the most feasible mode of distribution, in conformity with the views of the committee. Remember, they specifically targeted these supplies. And after such consultation, you will proceed without delay to the distribution, giving to it as much of your personal attention as is practicable the Greek Committee of New York. Now, May 24th, finally after a long journey, the ship arrives in Napoli. This is the next entry. This is from Colonel Miller himself. Now remember, he had been through war. He had become destitute himself. When you heard me mention after the fall of Messerlonghi, Messerlonghi is right here. He ended up all over Smyrna, which is off this map. Then he went back to the U.S., and came back, so now he's back in Napoli on a cargo ship much less suited for travel than the, the Constitution. So here's the entry, May 24th, arrival at Napoli. Early in the morning, we saw a boat put off from a frigate on the opposite side of the harbor and shape her course for us. It was not long before we discovered the stars and stripes. We're talking about the American flag of our own dear country and were highly gratified to learn from the commander of the boat that she belonged to the frigate constitution and you just saw the video it still exists a name particularly grateful to an american's ear when abroad and this is going to be important later a name particularly great great americans name abroad captain patterson had seen us the day before captain patterson is the commander the captain of the uss constitution at this time they haven't met him yet Beating into the harbor, had the goodness of not only to keep a light burning for us during the night, but he had sent his boat at this early hour to inform us of the present political state of Napoli di Ruania, and to afford us any assistance which might be in his power towards effecting the safe landing of our cargo. So remember, at this time, they didn't have Google meetings. Miller's coming back, his communication line was fairly dropped. He was at sea. What had happened is, the Greek, the Greek revolutionaries broke into civil war. You had two powers in the city, believe it or not, one was named General Grievous, <laughs> and the other was Kolokotronis. Ta was at Napoli, serving the people. He was also a warrior in his own right. Miller had not met him yet to get a, a briefing on what had happened. So he's, re he's receiving this from the boat to tell him what's going on. So that's May 24th. May 26th, this is Miller again, Colonel of the Hellenic Army. There are several thousand Greeks in the mountains which separate Argos from old Arcadia. Argos is right here on the map. Okay, so we're talking real places. And they still exist. We can go to them today. And this is important later when we talk about uh, uh, General, General uh, Jarvis. From old Arcadia. We judged it best to place 60 barrels at the mills of Napoli. Remember, Napoli is the capital. For the use of the sufferers in that quarter, and to ship 100 barrels on board an Ionian vessel, 
for those women and children who escaped from Messalongi before its fall. Remember, that's where Colonel Miller escaped also. These, so it must have been very emotional for him. These 100 barrels we shall consign to the English resident at the island of Calamos and request him to attend their distribution according to instructions of the committee. So if you remember, I read you the committee letter. Now, Miller, meanwhile, because he had just arrived from the United States of America, the active government of Greece was actually, it's the capital is Napoli, the, cap, the active government was in Portos, the island. So the island of Portos is over here. May 28th, Dr. Howe, nobly offering a, to devote his time to the distribution of the provisions at Napoli de Romania in the mills, and also to ship 100 barrels of flour to the island of Calamos. I gave him the following power to act in my absence. So this is what he's writing in his journal. Now he gave him a letter. Remember, you didn't have iPhones. You had to sign papers and put a, usually put a seal on it. So he hands Howe this paper to give him rights over the, over the distribution. And this comes important later. Know all men by these presents that I, J.P. Miller, agent of the executive committee in the city of New York. Again, remember, this is 1827, a long time ago. Do hereby authorize Samuel G. Howe, my countryman, to act in my place in the distribution of the provisions at Napoli and the mills, and also to ship 100 barrels of bread and flour for the suffering of Missologi Missongiotis of the island of Calamos, at the same time enjoining it upon him to keep strictly in view the great object of which these donations were made by our countrymen in the United States. Today, that's who you are. Remember that. A copy of my instructions from the committee in New York are here, herewith presented for your guidance. Agent of the Executive Greek Committee of New York, J.P. Miller. So he hands them this letter. So remember now, Dr. Howe is in Napoli. Two Greek war leaders, Kolokotronis and General Grievous, irony of the name, the lower, upper fort, the lower fort, basically in civil war. Howe's in the middle of this distributing aid. June 1st, and this is the repercussion what Howe does, he enlists Captain Patterson. So he did some machinations I won't get into with Dr. Howe to help the, the suffering, but he came to one conclusion. And listen to this, and this is where, where this comes in. Captain Patterson, remember, the captain of the USS Constitution, immediately sent me a letter enclosing one to the chiefs. I just mentioned them, right? They're in civil war in Napoli, interfering with distribution of humanitarian aid with all the chaos going on. In which he stated that the property they had seized upon was American and would be entitled to American protection until such time as it should be delivered by the agents of the committee to the poor. Remember, Dr. Howe is the agent. And that if they did not immediately deliver it into my hands, meaning Dr. Howe's, they would have reason to deplore the consequences. So remember, you saw in the USS Constitution how big it was. It's in the port with cannon. This letter, written in an ambiguous style, leaves Captain Patterson at liberty to pursue whatever course he may think proper, while it conveys an idea to the chiefs that he is determined at all events to get back the provision. In truth, by official policy, he wasn't supposed to interfere in other countries' endeavors. However, the issue here is that these are American goods. So as Howe explains it properly, he went above and beyond. He understood the suffering to help, to help the, the, the people of the land. So we flash forward. This is the letter uh, from Miller. It goes to the island of Poros. Gentlemen, he sent to the, gov the government that's on the island. So remember this chaotic situation. Two generals are in Napoli, and you have the government in the island of Poros. Miller was pulled into the island of Poros with a for aid to the, the sufferers. I received your letter and have lost no time in repairing to Poros and laying before you the instructions of the Executive Greek Committee of the City of New York, whose agent I have been appointed. In doing this, I beg leave to call your attention to a few remarks on the feelings of my countrymen towards your cause. Notice he doesn't say me, he doesn't say someone else specifically, he says my countrymen. And the more fully to unfold you my responsibility for a faithful application of the property committed to my care, 
to the objects for which it has been raised in the United States. You need not be informed by me, gentlemen, that this late period of your contest, that there exists a most lively interest in your behalf on the other side of the Atlantic. Among the many in the quarter of the world who have heard of your manlike resistance against the combined forces of the Ottoman Empire, and remember, this is the Ottoman Empire encircling the whole area, in the unprecedented state of wretchedness to which a most barbarous warfare has reduced many of your countrymen, the Executive Greek Committee of New York are not the least conspicuous, belonging, however, as they do, to a neutral power. Remember what I just said. The policy of whose government is never to be the first aggressor. The committee have confined themselves to the object of relieving the sufferings of women and children and old men, non-combatants of Greece. My instructions are strictly to this effect, and I have pledged myself to fulfill to the utmost of my power. Now, <clears throat> At this time, he's in Poros. We haven't mentioned Jar General Jarvis yet. General Jarvis was sent to the island of Aeneas. I want to read you a couple of entries because we talked about how and what was going on in Napoli is very dangerous. He had to involve the USS Constitution. Miller seems to have made it to Poros. Uh, Poros. Not a problem. But I want to give you an idea of what Jarvis had to go through. I'm going to read the letter Miller wrote, and you're going to read a very brief entry of, of what he did. To the primates of the island of Ayn, gentlemen, again, he's giving him a letter as a representation of the New York Committee now. He's now being endorsed as an agent. He will send you to island under the care of Mr. George Constantine and George Jarvis, sent 75 barrels of flour, 25 barrels of Indian meal, together with a large present of cloth, clothes, and shoes, all the donations of American citizens to the distressed widows, orphans, and old men who may happen to be in Ayn. Again, it's an island. I have given to Mr. Constantine and to my countryman, Mr. Jarvis, full power to distribute the above mentioned articles in such a manner as they think proper. Trusting, gentlemen, to your goodness to furnish them with a magazine to afford them every assistance in your magazine storage. Your power towards accomplishing the object of their voyage. I subscribe myself, your obedient and humble servant, J.P. Miller. And remember, Jarvis wasn't just somebody there. He was a, actually recognized as a general in the Greek army, as an American. Flash forward, this is a brief entry, and this is gonna, it makes a lot of sense what he had to go through. This is June 25th, 1827. Jarvis sailed in the course of the forenoon with before mentioned cargo for Kenkia, now Yonkris, taking with him several armed men as precaution against pirates. To understand, they weren't just shipping back and forth. Constant threat of pirates, constant threat of getting actually blown out of the water, to be honest with you. George Jarvis, in turn, returns one letter. And then I'm going to read, read another entry that I think will, is, is, will, especially what we've been through, will raise your mind. My dear Miller, I send by the captain of the boat, now remember, he left on a boat with armed men to protect the, the, the ar uh, articles meant for citizens and sufferers in, in Free Greece. I send by the captain of the boat a cargo of empty barrels, which I wish you to take and store in the best manner possible. The boatman has no freight to claim for you, and concerning myself, I hope by the second boat to inform you of everything which has passed. I have distributed within four days, so he distributed everything he had, 90 barrels of meal and 22 terraces of rice to about 5,000 souls, 5,000 people they took care of, most of whom have escaped. They thank God and the good people of the United States. Notice, they didn't, he didn't write, they thank Jarvis, they thank Miller, they thank Howe. They thank the people of the United States for this, which prolongs for a short time their existence. George Jarvis. Now, this next entry has more to do with un understanding the sentiment of these men that had actually gone to war there, and now they're distributing aid. So it's the 4th of July. We know what the 4th of July is in this country, right? So we're, we're talking about Greek Independence Day. We're talking about American Independence Day. Now, remember, this is 1827. It's not that long ago that America had her independence. And there's some key things here, and I'm going to ask you later after I present if you hear something interesting. Flash forward to the 4th of July in Free Greece, the island of Poros, July 4th, 1827. All eyes at Poros were turned towards me this morning, Colonel Miller, as the birthday of my nation. 
I therefore concluded to make a small dinner party. So he's making a dinner party now. <laughs> and close it by drinking a few toasts. So remember, when he says a dinner party, he's inviting other warriors. He's not, when he says a dinner party, he's not doing tea or anything. He's inviting warriors to, to this home to celebrate the birth of his nation. And close it by drinking a few toasts. Germans, remember, Germany wasn't a country now, so you had an ethnicity. Prussian warriors. Englishmen, Greeks, and Americans composed our party. We had many patriotic toasts, and the afternoon passed away agreeably. You understand? All these people at this time during the Greek Revolution on that island were celebrating the 4th of July. And there are other entries of how doing similar during the Revolution also. July 24th, so we're flashing forward. And I only have a few more entries. How much time do we have? About 10 minutes. Okay. July 24th, 1827. U.S. ship Constitution in Poros. <clears throat> Dear sir, I arrived here yesterday to give protection to any American vessel that I might meet with and learn that the ship, the Six Brothers, so I understand what this means now, had been here and had departed for Smyrna. <clears throat> I regret not having met you here as you might probably have given me information to govern my movements as respects my vessels. Remember, he had, they have a squadron. So the USS Constitution is the, is the flagship of the Mediterranean squadron. You might expect here at Napoli whether I have some idea of going. I have been at Kalori in the island of Salamis, and at Corinth. So Salamis is up here, Corinth you can see labeled up here. <clears throat> and at each place met numerous objects of charity and such come within your instructions in the distribution of provisions and should be happy to learn that someday be sent to them. This place will again be visited year long by my vessels with great respect and your obedient servant, Captain Patterson. So remember, he's just pulling into port. So he's hearing stories amongst the Greek civilian populace of the Americans that are coming with goods from across the country to help them, in many ways save them. One last entry to give you an idea. August 28th, uh, received Congress uh, cargo at Poros from the Committee of Philadelphia. Just to read off really quick, 500 barrels of bread and flour, 200 barrels of bread for Aina, 400 barrels of bread to Napoli de Romania, 400 to Fana, 100 the island of Milo, 100 to Calamos, 100 we propose to sell for the use of hospital. So for now, for a hospital, we intend to establish on Aina. So they, and they did establish a hospital, by the way. They had delivered, the, at the time, it was $76,000 worth of goods, which now is well over $2 million. Remember, this was a war-torn area. That's quite an amazing feat. So on the ground, they did this. Remember, we're talking about three men Three men, facilitated by the USS Constitution, provided goods from across the United States of America. One last entry, and then I'm going to go to it to how really quickly. This one is from Miller, and this is actually a very important entry. And it's titled, specifically, A Brave American. We're flashing forward now to December 21st. The Battle of Navarino had occurred in October, over here. The Ottoman fleet was crushed. Not by the Greeks, by foreign powers. I took James Williams. Remember, Mr. Katsos mentioned he was a slave from Baltimore. One place you could go if you were a slave, the U.S. Navy. Remember, he had fought in the Barbary Wars. This is why this entry is important to understand. A black man from Baltimore into my house, he having been some time in the hospital. And he was cared for by Dr. Howe, by the way. Williams came to Greece with Lord Cochrane was cooked for the Savior and, and conducted himself with great coolness and intrepidity in several engagements, particularly at the battle in the Gulf of Lepanto. Gulf of Lepanto is up in there. You can see in Aina, up here. <clears throat> Where he showed truly that he had been in the school of Decatur. If you remember, Decatur is the all-American warrior. He had died in a duel much earlier where he showed truly that he had been in the school of Decatur. For when no Greek could be found to take the helm, remember, this is Williams. He was serving in a different capacity. Williams volunteered his services, was there struck down by a splinter which broke his leg and arm. He had before contended with, with the Ottoman Empire, for he had lost a finger before Algiers in the United States service under Decatur. Being destitute of clothing, I provided him with a double suit. So here's an American warrior he's praising, and he came in, he was injured, and I believe he ended up dying of those wounds in Greece. And we're still doing some research on where. 
But the important here is he's being he's being given full warrant, full full praise by Miller. Did not hesitate to recognize who he was and what he did. And he provided him two suits of clothing as a fellow American. Now, next slide. Now, they had distributed all these goods. In 1828, Howe, Surgeon-in-Chief of the Hunted Fleet, returns to the, returns to the USA to raise aid. Now, he brings orphans in pleas with youth in traditional clothing in New York. Now, this scene was actually repeated multiple times. My daughter plays a useful, useful scene here because she's, she's young and dressed in clothing, too. So you can imagine the scene where Howe is in, in New York, and he, he says the following. At a public address, and this is actually by one of the orphans, this document was written a couple decades later recalling the effort. So he went over with Howe. At a public address on Greece by Dr. Howe, I was delighted to witness the American Philhellenism. So they're in New York now. Tears flowed from many an eye while Dr. Howe was describing the miseries of the Greeks. The three Greek boys dressed in their native costume were present and placed on a conspicuous place on the platform. One of the generous contributors having dropped $200. Now remember the fig the reason they gave you the figure before, $76,000 to two million? This person gave $200. That's a lot more than $200 today that they gave to the cause. And this was a repeated story. Took by the hand Christopher and accompanied him around the hall to receive donations of the friend of his country, the Greek boy's country. Everybody in the room was a friend of the country. The collection was a generous index of the praiseworthy zeal and active humanity of the citizens of New York. A great sum of money was collected that night. The hat which I passed around was full of bills. And again, this was repeated over and over. Something to note, Samuel Goodley Howe's future wife, their family adopted a Greek orphan. So she also was part of, part of the, the, the greater uh, committee, Greek committees herself. This is going to come into play in a little bit. May 20th, 1828, Miller arrives in Boston. So Howe, Howe had made his way and meets Howe from New York to Boston, where he was from. And remember, Miller's from Virginia. And you can imagine they're reminiscing after these journeys together. Howe's journey wasn't quite over. On the way back to the United States with the orphans, he was compiling his work, A Historical Sketch of the Greek Revolution. It is available on Google Books for free, published in 1828. That, that work was the number two listing in the publishing world at that time between Europe, US, and Canada. It raised support for the Greek cause again. It was revived because it had wavered a little bit. They went to relieve really, really those supplies. Time had gone on and it had wavered. This revived that, that essence. In January 1829, Howe returns to free Greece with aid from citizens of the USA again. So he was there to distribute. He returned and then he went back. And it wasn't just him. He was supported throughout the country. Next slide. To close, in Greece, outcomes. 1828, Brigadier General George Darvis died. We know he's buried in Argos. Remember Argos on the map? 1827, I have a question mark there. We're not quite sure. James William dies in Greece. Again, research still being done. 1830, February. Greece is recognized as an independent state under the London Protocol. The London Protocol of August 30th, 1832 reiterated the borders of Greece per the Treaty of Constantinople. Next slide. <clears throat> I think we missed the slide. We'll see it after. No, no. I, I had the slide of free, of free Greece. We can go back to it later. Greece was much smaller, but if you remember, basically what it expanded out, Peloponnesos, up to what I had shown on the map previously. U.S. outcomes. This is very important. Colonel Jonathan Miller's adopted son, so he adopted a son also. He became the first Greek American congressman. The process and rhetoric, remember, it wasn't just Miller and Howe, there were many people raising funding and support, talking and outings. They didn't have TV or Google. You had to talk in person like we're doing now, which is actually why you can ask your principal, I was insisting on doing on site. I wanted you to understand what they had to go through to collect funds. We couldn't do Google. It wasn't, it wasn't easy for me to get here. I'm several hours away. I came last night. Now imagine going across the ocean and across land territory on a wagon or on foot. 
The process and rhetoric used in the Philharmonic movement turned to support of abolition and women's suffrage movements. So it turns into a rights movement in the United States of America. Remember some of what I read to you, very important. The Miller and Howe families specifically were pivotal to both. So they were pivotal to the supplies. They were almost vehicles. They were also vehicles here of the many people supporting abolition and women's suffrage. Howe's wife in particular was a leader of the women's suffrage movement, specifically. Howe's family was also pivotal in the support of advantaged youth. And if you ever read uh, about uh, Perkins Institute of the Blind, you learn a lot more. I won't get into it now, but there's a lot to talk about there. 1861, at the request, who do you think the request was from? At the request of President Lincoln, Julia Ward Howe authored the, authored the lyrics to Battle Hymn of the Republic, and subsequently they say it became his favorite song. In January 1st, 1863, and again, this had blossomed, the movement, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. With that being said, I'm gonna end the presentation. Another rendition from the US Army. We started with the Dance of Zalonga. We're gonna end with Battle Hymn of the Republic by Julia Ward Howe, if you can. We'll just play a minute and 44 seconds if we can. So the wife of Samuel Gridley Howe wrote the lyrics. Again, the US Army. I think you have a class transition? Yes. Okay, great, wonderful. Thank you for allowing us to present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hill, Calista, uh, Mr. Katsos, we want to thank you uh, from the whole Plato Academy community. You guys had a very special privilege to be here and see someone who's so dedicated to promoting uh, Hellenic culture, or not someone, some people. You're here too, aren't you, Calista? And Mr. Katsos, we want to thank you very much um, for being a part of this, and we, we, we have all grown from the experience. So thank you all for being here. Thank we you. really appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks, Ms. Dobbs and Ms. Holly uh, from Plato Academy for doing a wonderful job orchestra.